Well, good morning, everybody. Um, there's a YouTube clip with me being interviewed by Hilda the Hare about a trial that we, we did for Sesame Workshop. And she actually shows a lot of in, insight into the methodological issues and challenges of doing randomized trials. So she kept me on my toes in that interview. Anyway, I'd just like to, before I start, to, as head of the School of Education at Queen's, just to welcome you all again um, to Queen's University. If this is your first time in Belfast, then um, welcome to the city, welcome to Northern Ireland, um, and you'll hopefully enjoy the, the seasonal weather that we have here, um, year by year. It's lovely. Um, <laughs> I don't know why it's so green, that's another matter but it's, it's a lovely place to be. I'm absolutely delighted to talk today and would like to really thank the conference organisers of BERA for inviting me. It's a privilege and an honour to be doing this. Um, I also don't usually go in for clever titles for presentations, but I'm quite proud of this one because it has two different interpretations which are really at the heart of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, and the first and most prominent one is the use of trials, randomised controlled trials in education as promoted by um, the move towards and the discourse around evidence-based practice, but also recognising the fact that the use of trials have been put on trial by the education research community. There's been ongoing concerns and criticisms levelled at RCTs, um, and I want to engage with those criticisms in this talk today. Um, before I sort of just run through what I'm going to do, I think I'll be honest with you from the outset about where I'm heading with all of this talk so you know where it's all going. Um, in essence, I'm concerned that as an educational research community, we've barely moved on from debates that we were having nearly 15 years ago around the use of RCTs in education. In the late 1990s, early 2000s, the use of trials in education was openly scoffed at. Um, seen as crudely positivist, entirely inappropriate for the complex world of education. Uh, and unfortunately, for the many conversations I have, the many talks that I do, uh, the engagement I have with colleagues all over the UK and beyond, I'm hearing the same arguments that I was hearing 15 years ago. And I have to say as well that a lot of those arguments do betray a limited understanding of RCTs and very little awareness of actually... Um, how RCTs have been used in practice. And this worries me um, because if significant sections of us as an educational research body continue to keep our heads in the sand, we're going to get left behind. And let's be clear, the rest of the educational world is moving ahead at a fast pace. So that whilst we are still saying that you can't do randomised control trials in education, the Education Endowment Foundation since 2011, is aiming to invest about £200 million in trials in England alone over the next 15 years. They've already funded about 100 trials involving over 4,000 schools in England, half a million pupils. Indeed, the current issue of Burge features an article by Stephen Garrard and his colleagues uh, publishing the findings of one of the first trials that the EEF funded. In Northern Ireland, our Centre for Effective Education has run over 30 trials to date, involving over 800 schools locally, 35,000 pupils. And of course, all of this indicates that while some of us remain firmly resistant to RCTs, they are being embraced with open arms by thousands of schools across the UK. And teachers, free from methodological baggage, just get it. We've never felt and experienced resistance through the hundreds of schools we've been working with. Teachers generally understand and get the notion of improving outcomes. They get the idea that we need to have some measure before and afterwards. We need a control group. They even get the idea of randomization. Also, just over the last two years, there's been a grassroots movement developing, taking the pace, research ed. I don't know if most of you will be familiar with research ed. Teachers themselves are getting together, organising, sharing findings, listening about the latest research, um, using these opportunities to get involved in projects, and all of them concerned with the notion of effectiveness, not being afraid to ask the question about what works, not seeing that as, as, as a, a bad question in and of itself. 
And all of these developments are very exciting, but they're very worrying. They're very worrying because grassroots organisations like this, funders like the Education Endowment Foundation and others, um, unless we start engaging fully with these uh, movements, we're just going to get left behind. And it's with that in mind that I want to focus my talk today on randomised trials. I want to say a little bit about just the logic behind them. Um, I want to use that as a starting point to then reassess some of the criticisms of randomised trials in education. Uh, but then, rather than just responding to those criticisms at an abstract level, and as, as is appropriate for this talk today, let's actually look at the evidence. Rather than saying we can't do like, randomised trials, let's actually look at what's been done in practice. Let's look at the types of trials that have been done to date, um, the types of issues they've addressed, the types of designs they've used, and let's see whether the evidence actually, the criticisms of RCTs stand up against the actual evidence of what's been going on for the last 30 years. Of course, all of this will raise challenges for people doing trials, for us as a broad education research community, and I want to come back to those challenges at the end. So let's begin then, really, with the logic of trials. And I'm aware many of you will understand all of this, but I do have to say with the conversations that I have with people, they don't, many people don't get this. So if I just go through this very quickly, so that you're aware of where my starting point is about trials, um, and then we'll look at the criticisms. But if we take any educational programme, if we're interested in a particular research question about whether that's effective or not, then we need to look at the students, for example, who are going through that programme. We need to see how they progress during the course of the programme. We need to get some sense of where they were at the beginning and some sense of where they progressed to at the end. Now, of course, we could stop at that point. We could say, look, these students have taken this programme. Look at how much they've progressed. Ipso facto, this programme's been effective. Hopefully, I mean, most of you will understand the flaw in that argument, but I have to say that I've seen quite a few educational research reports saying exactly that type of thing. And, of course, the flaw is that for most children, young people, they're going to develop anyway over time. We can't be sure that any progress that people make is down to the programme that they engage with. They're influenced by a whole range of other factors, some of which we can know, many of which we can never know what those factors are. In my own area in early childhood, for example, you look at a programme that runs over a year, you're going to see scores and development in most areas and domains simply because the children are developing, regardless of what programme they've been involved in. So that's why we need some type of comparison. We need to ask the question, not just what the progress has been made, the people taking the program, but critically, have they progressed above and beyond what we would have expected anyway? And it's that focus, that added value, that progression above and beyond what would have happened to a similar group of students that we're interested in. It's that additional bit which we can point to and say that is down to the effectiveness of the intervention or the programme or whatever it is that we're, we're doing. But of course, that argument rests entirely on, on the premise that we're comparing like with like. That actually, to all other intents and purposes, those two groups are the same. The only difference between them is that one's done the programme, one hasn't. And it's for that reason that we put a lot of store by randomization because we know that for large enough samples, when you randomly allocate students individually or as groups, classes, schools, to two groups, that randomization will broadly balance out all of the other factors and influences which can impact upon um, a child's learning or the outcomes you're interested in. So this is one of the fundamental misconceptions that randomised trials require us to control and identify everything that might influence somebody, to pin them down like we would do in a laboratory, um, and of course none of that's possible. And as I said before, most of the things that influence learning outcomes will never know what they are. But the point is, this type of design is neat, because it doesn't, you don't need to identify what the influences are, as long as you've created, through randomisation, two balanced groups, we can 
assume, other than random variation, that they're actually, we are comparing like with like. And when we do that, that's why we can be so confident about the gains that have been made being down to the intervention. Of course, that's the starting point. Randomised trials, as we're going to see shortly, many of them go beyond just looking at whether the programme's effective for everybody, to looking at is it differentially effective for different groups, for boys and girls, for those from back, different socioeconomic backgrounds, those with different reading scores at the start, whatever the focus is that we're looking at. So we can get quite sophisticated analysis in trials. Also, trials that can um, have alongside them qualitative components, if we do find effects, the qualitative case studies can help us understand what are the processes and factors which led to those effects. So this is, when I talk about trials, this is what I mean by trials. This is the very sort of simple logic behind trials. And if you look at it like this, you can imagine people from the outside just think, well, yeah, fair enough, that makes sense. If we take examples, let's just take two examples of what we might, how we might apply this in practice. Let's assume that our concern is that we want more girls in secondary school to take up science subjects. We might design an intervention, an initiative in year three, um, targeted at girls to increase their understanding, awareness uh, and enjoyment of science to, with the aim of getting them, more of them to sign up to science subjects at GCSE. Um, that's the initiative. We can recruit 40 schools, 20 randomly picked to implement that initiative, 20 to act as a control group. Our outcome measures at the end could be in, uh, interest in science, but crucially, as an outcome, how many of them are signed up for GCSEs in science? And if we find through this that more girls in the intervention group are signed up to GCSE science subjects, then the programme's been effective. We take another example, one which we've actually done here in Northern Ireland, of volunteer mentoring, tutoring programmes. We might be interested in trying to support struggling readers um, and use volunteer tutors from business and elsewhere to go into schools once or twice a week to listen to children read and to work with them. Um, and we might therefore, and this is what we did, we recruited 50 schools. For each school, their year two class, we asked the teacher to identify eight children that they felt would benefit from this type of volunteer tutoring program. Of those eight children in each school, each of the 50 schools, we randomly picked four to get volunteer tutoring. Um, and then we, we used various measures before and afterwards over the course of the year, it was actually a two year program, this one, um, to look at whether um, children that had volunteer tutoring actually had greater gains in reading than those that didn't. So again, that's the logic. There's a couple of examples of how it can work in practice. So with that in mind, if we move now on to the resistance that we've faced in relation to randomised trials. I'm not going to go over, I've, I've done this quite a bit now, I'm not going to go over this, the main arguments again, just really sort of summarise just some of the key issues. And I think probably the best summary is to go to our main research textbook uh, in education, Research Methods in Education by Cohen, Mannion and Morrison, our Bible. Um, not mine anymore, but our Bible, usually for when we teach educational methods. I'm going to read this out. This is what they say about randomised trials. When I'm reading it out, think that this is what our next generation of educational researchers are being taught about randomised control trials. This model, the RCT, Premised on notions of isolation and control of variables in order to establish causality may be appropriate for a laboratory, though whether in fact a social situation either ever could become the antiseptic artificial world of a laboratory or should become such a world is both an empirical and a moral question respectively. Further, the ethical dilemmas of treating humans as manipulable, controllable and inanimate are considerable. Randomised control trials belong to a discredited view of science as positivism. There we are. Uh, that is roughly... Now, people, I'm generalising. There's many people here doing trials. There's many people open to them. But I still hear this type of thing regularly when I scratch the surface. And it reflects a more sort of fundamental discourse that I've discussed elsewhere. I'm not going to go into too much detail now. 
but a discourse which creates two binary opposites. Those that are for practitioner research, for teachers, and those that are doing what works research, research from the devil. And you can see how these two boundary positions link together inappropriately, but they link together a whole range of things. So if you're doing what works research, you're only ever interested in quantitative. You're against practitioners. You're working against them rather than in collaboration. It's oppressive. It's quantitative methods. It's theoretically naive. Stifles reflective practice. Now, I can't go through all of that today, but if we distill it all right down to four fundamental charges that are levelled at RCTs, and that's going to be my starting point for the next part of the presentation. And these are them. Firstly, that it's just not possible to do randomised trials in education. I think Cohen, Mannion and Morrison say that a couple of times in their book. Secondly, that RCTs ignore context and experience, the things that are crucial to understanding education and how people learn and develop. Three, that RCTs seek to generate, univer generate universal laws with this misguided positivism of trying to create universal laws of cause and effect. And fourth, that RCTs are inherently descriptive, just reporting what works and what doesn't work. They're atheoretical or at best theoretically naive. Now, as I said, rather than trying to address each of these points separately um, and in an abstract level, I thought it'd be quite good to practice what I preach and let's look at the evidence. Let's have a look at actually what trials have been published in education. I'm expecting to find none because we've been told that they, don't, they can't be done. So let's see what trials have actually been done in education. Um, let's see the type of trials, the type of designs that they've used. And then let's take these four charges and see whether the evidence actually stacks up in terms of, of these criticisms. Um, to do this, we've done a systematic review. We're just finishing it off now. Um, just to say, actually, these, I've done a few of these talks, some of which have been videoed. There's only my mum seen the videos, so it's... <laughs> and, of course, myself a thousand times. Um, but the thing is, when you do videos, it's like the comedian's sort of... I'm not a comedian, by the way, but it's like the comedian's curse being televised because all your best jokes and points are, have, have gone into the ether. So I thought, when I was thinking about what to do here, I thought I've got to do something more than just come back on all of these points and give examples. And I thought, just before the summer, what a great idea to do a systematic review. Let's just look at, do a systematic, thorough search of every trial that's been done in education since 1980. I'm lucky to have had Kira Keenan, who's a full-time PhD student, uh, working with me on this. It wouldn't have been done without Kira. She's around somewhere, and I can see her. Very embarrassed at the moment. Um, Kira really has organised all of this. Um, it did mean that when I was in Italy over the summer, I was sat by the pool, sifting through abstracts on my iPad. Um, it also meant that we've got a team of people who did the coding of the studies over the last couple of weeks, and the last ones came back last night. Um, and so the analysis is, is less than 12 hours old. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing that again, by the way, if you're going to do, work out what you're going to do a long time before a keynote presentation. I used to have a lot of hair before the summer as well, and it's all... So this is what we did. We did a search, a systematic search. I'll show you what we searched in a minute, um, Kira and myself. Um, and we were very strict because we were open, re really sort of open to the, the fact that people might say, well, yeah, you've got all these studies, but none of them are to do with education. So we had very strict criteria. We only um, retrieved studies which were true randomized experiments that actually involved the random allocation of pupils or groups of pupils. We only studied, um, included studies which were of interventions based in and having the involvement of educational institutions. There were a load of studies which just used convenient samples in universities of, of um, degree students that did trials, nothing to do with the university itself, and we rejected all of those. So we only looked at those randomised trials that were based in and had the involvement of an educational institution, whether that was preschool, kindergarten, 
through primary, secondary, and up to college and university. And we also only included trials which included at least one educational outcome. And by educational outcome, we mean outcomes about the increase, the development of knowledge and skills. So there had to be, so phys physical activity programs, for example, if it was just um, an initiative within a school which encouraged children to walk to and from school, and the outcomes were heart rate and BMI, then we didn't include that. But if it was in included with it was a curriculum, teaching about and increasing awareness and knowledge, um, then we did include that. So we're very strict in what we put in. These were the databases we searched. We are limited at the moment. We'd like to expand this further, but we searched only English language databases. The first five are sort of typical ones that you'd be aware of. The sixth was our attempt to try and get to the grey literature, the unpublished dissertations and theses that are available. And for anybody interested, this was the search terms, the sort of structure. They adapted slightly depending on the database. But we really searched for any study which had at least one of the following in each of these three strings. So it had to have mentioned in the title or the abstract something from the first string and something from the second and something from the third. You see why my summer went away and particularly Kira's, but we found through all of that searching 5,618 studies. Putting those together, 1,486 were duplicates so we could remove them. So we then had just over 4,000 studies to actually screen. So individually, mainly Kira, but I did do some random sampling myself. Um, we went through every study, the title and the abstract, and on most occasions we could decide whether they were eligible or not based upon the abstract. Uh, for those that didn't, we went to the full texts. Of these, oops, of these we found 802 studies. Um, it's worth saying that that's an underestimate, clearly, because it doesn't include non-English language trials internationally. Um, and we only went for educational institutions. So there's a whole range of trials which have an education focus in the home and the community, which this doesn't include. And clearly, in certain circumstances, randomised trials are not possible. And there's, this is probably the tip of the iceberg. There's probably equal amounts, if not more, quasi-experimental designs. But at least we've got here some sense of the overall figures of true randomised trials in education institutions, and there are at least 800 of them. And of these 800, then, we went through and gathered extracted data. So we, we coded for each study the year of publication, the type of institution, the primary outcomes that were focused on, the sample size, and so on. But particularly mindful of the criticisms of RCTs. We also, for each study, coded whether it included any subgroup analysis. Did it just look at the overall effects, or did it have a more sophisticated analysis of what was going on? Did each study include a qualitative component? Did any study explicitly engage with theorists or theories? And did they have any discussion about the limits to generalizability? So we're trying to get at all of the criticisms that were leveled at RCTs, particularly those four main ones that have gone through, some sense from these 800 which have been uh, produced over the last 30 years, how many actually did the sorts of things that trials are being criticized for not doing? So on to the findings. Then, as I said, there's 800. We, we still are searching 56 trials, so this is based on 740 odd of the, the trials that we were able to get full texts for. You can see, first of all, then, as I was mentioning right at the start of the presentation, the, the field is moving rapidly. Um, two thirds of trials that exist that we found were published in the last 10 years. Very few. Um, historically, and then a clear increase. That last year is uh, misleading because that's 2015. So we've still got half a year to go. So you can imagine that last bar will go up with the rest. If we imagine that we've missed a few studies, I think that the basic 
conclusion from this is that today, in the last few years, we are now seeing at least 100 randomised trials published each year. And if anything, that's set to increase. Half of them are cluster randomised trials where schools have been randomised rather than individuals. The other half, though, are individuals, pupils, students being randomised. And you can also see that we're not talking about very small little experiments going on in schools. Over a quarter of all the trials involved at least 1,000 participants. 40% involved over 500 participants. So we're talking about substantial trials. In terms of where these trials were done, it's of no surprise that half of them, 50% exactly, were done in North America. But 29% were undertaken in Europe. Uh, and within that, 11% of all the trials we found in the UK and Ireland. In terms of the educational institutions, you can see the dominance, about two thirds of trials have been done in the statutory sector, primary and secondary education, but also not in significant numbers in some of the other sectors. The ones around college university are overwhelmingly um, medical students training, trials of sort of effectiveness, different techniques of medical students, nurses, um, other professional um, student courses. Also, just to re-emphasise the point that we're not looking mainly at just one-off quick interventions which are done one day, evaluated the next. Uh, a significant proportion of these trials are of substantial interventions. Twenty-nine percent of the interventions that have been trialled went on for at least one academic year. Nearly half, 44 percent, went on for at least a term. And in terms of the primary focus for the trials, you'll see the dominance of just about half of the trials were around physical health, social well-being, behaviour. So this would include all of those trials which had a focus on physical activity, nutrition, mental health, social emotional learning, behavioural change, anti-bullying, sex education and so forth. So a very sort of strong focus on social outcomes. Within that, about 17% of trials looked at literacy or numeracy outcomes as their main focus. Um, and about a quarter, 23%, looked at academic outcomes in one form or another as their main focus. So, back to the four key questions, criticisms. Is it possible to do randomised control trials in education? Uh, as my teenage children would say, duh, yeah. Obviously, um, I think you can see, even from that quick overview, uh, not just the numbers of trials that have actually been done and published, over 800, at the very least, a conservative estimate, but the range, the, the range of different types of design, the range of different outcomes, the different institutions that have been undertaken in, different durations of the interventions that have been taken. So uh, we're resounding clear evidence that you can do randomised trials in education. So at least, if there's nothing else, you may find some of my other points now um, debatable, but let's at least accept that you can do trials in education. But secondly then, do randomised trials ignore context and experience? And I'm addressing these questions, not that I'm claiming that all of the ones that, that did uh, include a qualitative component, for example, have done it really well. There's got to be varying degrees of, of quality. And one of the things we can do with this database now is draw people together who can actually take a, a very rigorous look at the quality of the qualitative data, sort of take sub-themes. And if people are interested in that, please contact me. I think there's a resource here. After all, that summer of hard work that we would like to try and use. What I am saying, though, is that when we're looking at these next three questions, these are made in absolute terms. These are claims that you can't do. Trials just can't do this. Trials can't take context into account. Trials are inherently descriptive. So all we have to do is to show that actually 
Not all trials are, are doing this. There's actually some clear evidence that people doing trials are addressing these themes. And if we can show that, then we can show that the situation is a lot more complex than we've been given credit for. So we go back to the idea, can randomized trials look at context and experience? But what we found was that 46%, nearly half of all those trials that we looked at, included some subgroup analysis. So rather than just saying, here's the program, that's the students that did it, it worked, it didn't work. They did do that, but they also then went on to say, well, did it work differentially? Did it work more or less for children, students from different backgrounds, from different contexts and situations? So there's already a clear set of effort going on in the RCT community to look at these broader questions of subgroups of contexts. But also about a third of the studies actually reported some qualitative data. A further 7% said that they'd done qualitative data collection but didn't report it in the article. And this is one of the problems of being confined to 7,000 words or less when you're reporting. You can't report everything. But 41% of all of the studies had some qualitative component to what they were doing. So my view is that it's clear that if you're doing RCTs, whether you, you do it well or not, but you can certainly take into account context and experience. Do RCTs seek simply to generate universal laws of cause and effect? Well, clearly not. If Nearly half of the researchers are looking at how effectiveness might be differentiated for different groups. So they're moving already away from sort of notions of universal laws. If you do this, everybody's going to react like that. But 85%, nearly the vast majority of trials, had some discussion about the limits of generalizability of what they were doing. They were clearly aware of the need not to overgeneralize, not to apply what they're doing across the board. Now that may show us that some of the problems that we may feel, the unease of how trials are being used in policy terms, may be actually not down to researchers doing trials, but down to, to politicians, down to various other stakeholders using and abusing the results of trials. That's a different issue. But in terms of doing trials themselves, it's quite clear that efforts are being made to keep our feet on the ground in terms of the claims that we make. And are RCTs inherently descriptive, atheoretical? What we did for each study was just have a, a sort of simple categorization. So one category was, did that study make explicit reference and engage with a theorist or um, a clear sort of theoretical perspective? Uh, beyond that, did they at least have a theory of change? It would have been descriptive, just that our thinking is, if you do this, it will lead to that and that. So there might not be theories behind it, but there's sort of a, a, at least some notion of a, a theory of change. Or did they not do anything? And there were a few trials that just didn't report any theories, just reported results. Here's the program, it's effective. But what we found was about a third of all the trials published did explicitly mention and engage with um, theoretical perspectives. And a further 44% at least had some notion of a theory of change. But it does raise a question about whether we should be putting too much onus on individual trials um, in terms of theory generation. And if we take another context, take qualitative work, take qualitative work on, in my own area, on racism and children, there's actually, not every study, qualitative study, needs to have theory as its focus. There's something important about having well-documented experiences of, of racism, well-documented attitudes of young people um, out there in the public domain. And maybe there isn't a big strong theory around that, but that is evidence, it's data which then, then can be used by others who are taking a, a step back, who are synthesizing a, a range of different qualitative studies and then drawing out theoretical uh, arguments. So, so my view here, you'll see when we get to the final slide, there is a, an emphasis on, and we should be encouraging more use of theory in trials. But I don't think that necessarily is needed all the case. But actually, there's also a need for trials, the need for more trials just to produce um, evidence about different programs operating in different contexts, having different effects. 
because theory generation then, in a similar way to the qualitative example, can take place at another level, can take place through systematic reviews and meta-analysis. Um, this is just an example of uh, a systematic review. I mean, part of my work is with the Campbell collaboration. This is a, a meta-analysis taken from a systematic review looking at the effects of volunteer tutoring programs. And the authors of this review uh, identified a number of different randomized trials that have been done on volunteer tutoring programs. What you see are the names of the studies down the left. But on the right-hand side, these little dots represent the average um, effect size found in each study. Oh, I've got a light here. Uh, and what you see, this line is zero. So if there's dots on this line, it means it's had no effect at all. And what you can see is that overall, most studies had a positive effect. The volunteer tutoring led to a positive effect. What you also see is a number of studies which had to be found negative effects. The key point is that individual trials are dangerous to put too much store in because at the very least there's random variation from trial to trial. But actually in most cases, um, and in the meta-analysis we do in the Campbell collaboration, we assume that actually that variation isn't just random. But actually there are other factors influencing this random variation. And they could be the different types of students that are involved in tutoring. So one study could be of African Caribbean children, one could be of white children, one could be of older, younger. So age, gender, ethnic background, socioeconomic background, the type of tutoring arrangements and so on, all will have an impact on that variation. All I'm doing though is showing you that with this as raw material, through meta-analysis, we can pool that data and start ask, asking much more sophisticated questions, not just whether volunteer tutoring works, but classically, does it work, for whom, in what contexts, and under what circumstances? So even if individual trials are not generating theory, theory can be tested and can be generated through broader meta-analysis. And more importantly than that as well, um, and this is what has been done, has been done for, for a number of years now, rather than just looking at overall programs as black boxes, what a number of um, meta-analysts have done is to break down programs, look at key elements of programs, and use meta-analysis to look at well, which elements are critical to improving outcomes. One example of that is a systematic review by Tharrington and Toffee, published with the Campbell Collaboration over 10 years ago, looking at anti-bullying programs. And they identified 20 elements of programs, such as having a whole school policy, having clear supervision of playgrounds, having parent training, teacher training, and so forth. And for those 20, they then looked at something like this, but looked at how much that variation is down to these different elements, which elements actually had a significant impact upon reducing bullying. And it actually could, is there a particular combination that might work best? And for which groups and which types of school? The only point I'm trying to sort of stress from all of this then is that theory generation isn't just in individual trials, as it's not just in individual qualitative studies, but there's this broader context. The more trials we do, the more we have an evidence base to do this type of much more sophisticated analysis. Two more slides to go. So conclusions and then challenges. Conclusions are, well, hopefully you can see now my, my concerns at the beginning of a talk. I want to be clear up front. I am concerned that there are sections within our body as educational researchers which are just having our heads in the sand. Um, and whilst we still argue that you can't do trials, uh, the rest of the world is passing us by. And you can see um, the number of trials in education is growing significantly. And roughly now, year by year, there's 100 more trials going in every year being published. Also, I, I hope you can see that whilst it's still a developing field, trials, as hist Anne Oakley has done brilliant work looking at the history of the use of trials in social interventions. So there's great examples going back many decades. But for us, the vast body of work right now is happening over the last 10 years. So it's a new, growing field. But hopefully you can see that that field is dynamic, 
It is accepting the challenges of context, of experience, of the limits of generalization, and is already actively exploring, as far as it can with the evidence that it has, the questions about what works for whom, in what contexts, and under what circumstances. And that was my third point. And I do think, as I've stressed already, that actually rather than being atheoretical, there can be trials. You just have a black box. You measure children at the beginning and at the end and something works or it doesn't work. But I don't think many of us doing randomized trials operate like that. Um, many of us see it as a great way of doing theory testing. We have a number of PhD students at Queen's, I know they exist elsewhere, whose focus is doing a randomized trial. And as you know from a PhD, you have to have a theory chapter, you have to engage with theory um, and look at theories of reading or whatever it is that you're, you're focusing on and have that as a rationale for the trial. But the trial then, with the quantitative elements and the qualitative elements, really can add to our understanding about situations and what's going on. Finally though, five challenges and something at the end. I think there's an urgent need for the education research community to develop its awareness and understanding of trials. Hopefully you can see from the data presented today, it's worrying when I still get told by experienced academics and research and education that you can't do trials. I have to be really blunt and say there's a, not just a lack of understanding of trials, but a lack of awareness that trials even exist. People are not even looking at the evidence of what's been published before um, pronouncing judgment on it. So we need more awareness raising and development. Um, I think we do need to encourage more RCTs um, to use qualitative methods and engage more explicitly with theory. Our work with the Education Endowment Foundation, we've had sort of training sessions where we meet annually and last year we were very strongly making that case that maybe not just when you've got the, pre, the post test you finish, but actually that's where you start the qualitative. You go back there and have, haven't found what you found to go back and say, well, how did that happen? Why is that group of young people particularly doing well? But what's going on? And the Education Endowment Foundation and other funding bodies are very open to that type of work. So we need to encourage more people doing trials to do qualitative, to engage with theory, but that isn't to say that they're not already. But thirdly, we need to encourage more educational researchers to bring their subject and methodological expertise to trials. This is something I've been trying to do with six, some success in the School of Education at Queen's. We have people in the Centre for Effective Education with great experience doing randomised trials, but what we also need are people who actually know the subject knowledge, know about maths education or literacy. And we have those in the department, but they're people that haven't done trials, that maybe don't do quantitative. But we need to start now thinking in terms of working as teams. So people can bring their expertise, their subject knowledge, and their methodological expertise in doing qualitative work, doing case studies. And through multi-method designs, we can actually start doing really creative, exciting stuff. We also need to further develop collaboration and collaborative approaches to trials. I've not had the chance to talk about this today, but one of the criticisms at the beginning that you would have seen from that discourse is that trials um, are done on teachers, done on schools. They're, they're not collaborative ventures. And yet all of the trials we've done have been in close collaboration with educational organisations, with teachers. We've pioneered the way in terms of involving children and young people at Queen's in trials, in doing, um, informing the design of trials, identifying what the outcome should be, helping to interpret the evidence from trials. It is possible to have very collaborative open, co-constructed ways of doing randomised trials. And fifthly, more investment is needed in systematic reviews. Trials can be dangerous if you take one trial on its own and build a whole policy around it. We do need to, to look at things in the whole and develop a more nuanced account through systematic reviews and meta-analysis. My final point is one that Ian started with in his introduction for me, but I do want to finish with, and this is the point that took me from doing ethnographic qualitative research on children 
and racism and gender to doing trials. It's not that I've replaced one with the other. I'm not for one minute saying everybody should stop doing qualitative work and start doing trials. Trials are not the gold standard for education. I've said this at Campbell Collaboration, Colloquia, and everywhere else. Trials are great at answering a particular question about effectiveness, but they're absolutely rubbish at understanding what's going on. So let's, let's be clear about that. Qualitative work, theoretical work is intensely important, but there is a role for trials. But what has got me to interested in trials is that as somebody committed to social justice, as many of people here are as well, by definition, we're interested in outcomes. We're interested in addressing inequalities, in improving social inclusion. So we, inevitably, we have to be interested in what works, what programs are gonna reduce inequalities, what programs will reduce social exclusion. And if we start asking those questions, we're inevitably drawn into doing and thinking about measurement, thinking about that logic that I went through at the beginning, if we're going to have robust evidence. And what we've found is that some of the trials we've done are programmes aimed at um, increasing the inclusion of disadvantaged children, of reducing inequalities. Many of them haven't worked. And politically, that's a very important thing for us to know because policymakers will hold up various interventions as being the silver bullet for addressing inequalities, but through trials, through a, a radical and a, a, a thorough approach to researching interventions, we've got an important role to play as people committed to social justice to actually saying, actually, there's no evidence that that works. There's actually evidence that that's causing more harm. And there's evidence over here that this does improve GCSE results, does improve whatever it is we're interested in. Thank you very much. <laughs>